there's been different initiatives before that one minute we're talking around putting solar panels on people's roofs. Then we're trying to push people down hydrogen ready boilers. Then we're talking around air source heat pumps. There needs to be consistency. I mean, that's a real value that I hold close. You need to be able to instill confidence in the customer that you're working with. You want to give them good advice, communicate clearly with them, and then deliver a good service. Hello, I'm John Ingram Marriott, and this is a field service story brought to you by Big Change. We're delighted today to welcome Peter Holmwood, Managing Director of SES Home Services, part of the Pennon Group. Peter, you've been a big change user since 2016, and it would be really helpful for you to give us some context about the UK water industry and SES in particular. John, thank you for making time to see me today and hosting me at Big Change. It's really exciting to be here and talk to you about the challenges that face the energy and water sector how we lean into those challenges and how we can support customers with the transition that is ahead of us and how we support people in their homes through decarbonisation and a move to the net zero and achieving the government's targets of hitting net zero by 2050. It's a really ambitious target. Huge amounts of changes needed across the sector to support that. The field services industry has to move with that and move with the times, embrace new technologies, new ways of working with customers. And it's a real period where we have to understand how we deliver change on scale and at speed. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned changes. Um, perhaps you can give us an idea of the sort of things that uh, you're going to have to implement within the industry, given the drivers and the issues you've raised. I mean, you've already mentioned the, the smart metering, for example. I mean, that is going to be a, a massive job. I mean, how many smart meters are we talking about? I mean, so smart metering is one part of that change that needs to be delivered across the industry. Mm -hmm. That's the rollout of smart metering to mm -hmm. domestic customers on their water supplies to understand water consumption in the home. Our, my business is focused on domestic properties and domestic customers and how we can add value back into that customer segment. In the UK property market, currently around 20% of the UK's carbon emissions, for example, are generated through the domestic heating sector. So we know that that's a real area of opportunity. And what the government are looking to do in there is phasing out the installation of gas boilers by 2035. That will give us a move towards low carbon heating. But that action will place increase in demand on the electrical network. So there's a lot of information in the press at the moment around air source heat pumps and how they will play a central role in delivering net zero. Air source heat pumps are only one part of the solution. That's a technology that's been around for decades. It's featured heavily in the press at the moment. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to take forward in that sector as well to even make air source heat pumps viable as a product in most homes. There's a lot to understand there. And the trade has to move and learn from wind installations of the past. Now, if we talk about air source heat pumps, 600,000 installs is the government target by 2028. And I think year to date in 2024, there's been around 30,000 installs carried out of air source heat pumps. So what you put that down to, 30,000 against 600,000, what, what, what's causing that big backlog of installation? Well, I think firstly, there's got to be consumer appetite. Customers mm. have to trust that technology and understand how it fits into their home and to gain that trust they need to work with contractors and trades people that understand that technology as well there's not a one-size-fits-all solution right air source heat pumps i feel is part of that and it can play a key part but it all comes down to the design of the system how it's specified to meet the type of property you're installing it in the type of customer that's going to be on the end of that system those two things have to work together and then you have to get the installation right to really achieve the efficiencies that a heat pump does deliver. So try and pulling that together. Um, you've got a systemic change in the water industry. You mentioned smart metering. You mentioned air source heat pumps. Uh, you haven't mentioned pipe replacements, which I know is a big issue every time you drive down our local road. You haven't mentioned water leakage. It, it strikes me that the industry has some very sizable issues to manage. I'm kind of keen to see how you have used technology to 
assist you in coming up with solutions for that when you've also made the comment earlier about the, the shortage of manpower. Yeah, of course. I mean, re really valid points. I think when you speak around the demand that's going to be placed on the uh, electrical grid, you know, at, at the moment, I think it's around 67 million people in the UK. That number's forecast to go up to 75 million by 2050. Mm -hmm. So without changing anything, you've got a growing population demand that's going mm -hmm. to place strain on infrastructure. Yes, so you made the comment about the massive change in the market, never mind things like government legislation, net zero, you mentioned uh, the whole need to put smart meters in. We've spoken about the need to replace the gas boilers with the new devices, etc. cetera. Um, how are you going to cope with that from a, both a logistical and a technical, technological point of view? It's, it's going to place huge demands upon field services companies. Mm -hmm. And looking at how we can deliver an ever-growing number of jobs. I mean, e even without changing the shape of the landscape around us, when you look at the increase in population within the UK, that alone would place stress on the infrastructure that's in place. So currently, I think there's around 67 million people in the UK. By 2050, that figure is going to be 75 million. So there would be all that additional headcount to provide for through the infrastructure that's in place. But then we're going to compound some of that through this change and targets towards achieving net zero. Mm -hmm. So more infrastructure needs to be built. If you're specific around the energy sector, there's all sorts of concepts there that will be developed, looking at uh, localized uh, electrical energy storage solutions, battery storage, how can communities generate and store and use their own energy and potentially sell it back into the grid at the right time and achieve a funding for that. There's EV that obviously is going to play an ever increase in demand on the draw of electricity. More wind farms, more solar panel installations. All of that extra energy then has to be transported to the point of use. So either pylons going in undersea routes, potentially underground electrical networks. So again, just an ever-increasing amount of work that needs to be delivered. And then we spoke briefly about the water sector, all of the smart meter installations that need to be undertaken and then supporting customers with that activity, making sure that everyone understands their water consumption, how can we make homes water efficient, how can water companies achieve a reduction in per capita consumption, so the amount of water that's used per person in the home every day. There's all of these things that need to come together to support the 2035 and the 2050 targets as we move towards net zero. We have to find solutions to provide field services for the existing volume, as well as all of this additional demand that's going to be generated. So that is a mouthful of things which have to happen in an industry which hasn't necessarily been, dare I say, the most forward looking without wishing to be too contentious, um, clearly things have changed. So you've set the scene there, and it's pretty evident, isn't it, from the remarks you've made here, that uh, there is a phenomenal amount of change having to take place over the next 5, 10, 15, 25 years. What's the magic date? What's the magic year? Where is it 2035 that all cars have to be EV? Is that 2035? So I think there's targets around 2035, specific with energy and with boiler installations. So no more gas boiler installations in new build properties. Obviously up until that point, we still need to look at how there's around 1.7 million boilers replaced annually currently and around 80% of those are believed to be a combination boilers. So we have to look at what's the opportunity that's there today. How do we engage and work with those customers and look at the different technological solutions that are available to them to start them on that journey towards low carbon heating in the home. I mean, let's just do the numbers. So we're two, 2035, we're 2024. We've got 11 years, 11 years to put smart meters, to change cars to EV, EV charging points. You mentioned the aging water pipes. We haven't even mentioned heat pump installations yet in terms of the numbers. In a field sector which is driven by enormous changes in the need to distribute electricity, uh, we've already mentioned the gas industry got Victorian pipes um, and we've got the telecommun 
telecommunications industry ripping up our streets to put more fiber in. It seems that this is a perfect storm. Uh, and I just can't see how you can manage out of that muddle. What have you been doing within your organization to enable your teams, both your own and third party teams to affect the amount of change and installations that you need to do? I think it's a, a really interesting time hearing all of those chat, what, what's there ahead of us? Huge amounts of work, current shortage of skilled labor, and then we're putting more installation volumes on top of that as well. So I think as an industry, progress really needs to be made from apprenticeship level all the way through to making sure that we can build, train and retain capable people in our industry. And I'm proud to work for a company that has, and a group that has an extensive apprenticeship program. That, that's going to play a key role in supporting new entrants into the market. You mentioned there briefly around heat pumps, so 600,000 installations a year is the target, I think, by 2028. It's currently around 1,800 MCS accredited installation companies. We need to leverage those companies and help build more capability and more capacity. Equally, those companies that already exist, they will want to deliver more installations. You know, they'll be undertaking other types of plumbing and heating work at the moment, and how can we... What's out there to support those companies being more future focused around that technology? I think once we kind of understand what's there, it's then around how do you increase that capacity? How do you provide more volume and more capability? I think it's going to come through a number of areas, really. Customers have to have confidence in the engineer that's in the home. You know, you have to build, you know, we work really hard as a company. My engineers work really hard with our customers to try and build trust. And you have to build trust one relationship at a time. I think once we can start to see that customers are confident in the service that's being provided to them from an engineering team, you can then start to engage with those customers around the technology that's available to them and help them build trust. Customers have had their fingers burnt before by initiatives and funding and tariffs and companies have built up to build capacity for certain types of installations. So solar thermal and solar PV, huge amounts of installations that were carried out early on when the tariffs were really high, you had companies setting up overnight and moving out of other industries to deliver that activity because they wanted to draw on that funding. They thought there was some money to be made there. So unfortunately, that negatively impacted some customers because their installations weren't fit for purpose. So I think if we want to support people in their homes, to be able to really deliver systems at speed that deliver the efficiency savings that are achievable. We have to make sure the workforce is skilled and understands the properties they're working in. Like I said before, there's no one size fits all solution. But I think once, we've, once we land on the route to make customers have faith in the technology and build up engineering teams, you know, there's more and more training becoming available the criticality behind designing systems. You know, we're, I'm from an industry where historically when one board has been swapped out for another one, it's a rule of thumb. And if you've had 28 kilowatts in there before, you put 28 kilowatts back in. Property doesn't need that. I think we really have to take it back to basics to make sure systems are designed well, people understand what they're getting, customers understand the solutions they're gonna be left with and how they live with it. And it has to work for their property and work for them. So let's pick up on a couple of the points there. You've So we got uh, customer perception. They've been burnt in the past. So there's a lot of anti-feeling out there. There's a mistrust, I think, of uh, government diktat, government legislation. Would you think that's a fair point? People aren't keen about smart meters, for example. I think there's certain perceptions that are out in there. In the marketplace. So. I think, definitely. I think when you, when you spoke briefly there around, there's been different initiatives before that one minute we're talking around putting solar panels on people's roofs. Then we're trying to push people down hydrogen ready boilers. Then we're talking around air source heat pumps. There needs to be, there needs to be consistency. I mean, that's a real value that I hold close. I think that if we can be consistent around the types of technologies that we want to talk to customers about, the benefits they can provide to them. In my mind, our ambition should be around how do we support people to for a low carbon home not just to fit an air source heat pump or to fit pv panels on the roof or to fit any type of other technology 
we need to understand what's there that what's available because you need to be able to instill confidence in the customer that you that you're working with you need to want to give them a good we want to give them good advice communicate clearly with them and then deliver a good service and you need to make sure that that service through a growing field team and new people coming into the industry you need to have certain controls and systems behind all of that to make sure that actually you maintain that quality as you look to scale any business. Come on then. So <clears throat> there's so much change going on and we just alluded to that. And I mean, given a litany, litany of issues that need to be addressed um, within your own organization, then how do you go about managing the projects and the work and job? What, to- what technology are you using and why are you using the technology you're using? So uh, just to give you some context on that, John, I've, been with our company for 20 years right i um originally joined intending to just complete a gap year before going off to university didn't really know exactly what i wanted to do at uni Mm. but i thought i'd find something so i joined uh, ses home services and within three months really enjoyed the industry the people that i was surrounded by the energy that they had and actually what we wanted to achieve so took up a formal apprenticeship, went through that apprenticeship, came out as a heating engineer, and then after a few years began my transition away from an engineer, went through various roles and have moved up through a number of operational positions now to managing director. The the business that I remember 10, 15 years ago, we were paper-based, you know, you had 30 odd engineers out working every day, completing paper-based timesheets, uh, a job sheet which had three copies of paper on it for every customer's property that you went into. I mean, we would have been generating probably three to five tons worth of paper every year just on job sheets. Mm. And we put a really early, before I was in a management position, there was an early PDA based system that came into place. If you wanted to make any changes to it, it took six months of development just to have an additional question added on a worksheet. So when we were introduced to big change and the type of system that was available to us, it felt a real natural fit back into the business. So I remember whilst we were looking for a new solution to bring through, one of my early conversations with the engineers was around introducing just a vehicle tracking system, nothing else, just a tracking solution. That pitch didn't go very well. And there were a number of challenges that they came back with which, you know, they're entitled to do so. But what we found as part of that exercise was we were able to listen to the engineers and understand actually what were they missing, what would help them. And that's where we found big change as a solution, implemented that into the business. And what what it's allowed us to do over time is deliver a number of improvements, not only for people in the back office, for engineers in the home, but you know, most importantly for our customers and the clients that we serve, it's been a re- it's been central to how we now run our business and how we try to prepare to scale. We see an opportunity for our business to deliver more of this activity we've been speaking about on the screen. You know, talk around meter installations and air source heat pumps and solar thermal and solar PV. We're a customer facing business. We want to support people in the home. We're going to need more engineers to achieve that and this type of solution gives us confidence to scale and maintain quality you know it's all about quality in the home we want to deliver for our customers we want to deliver a good service and i feel systems like big change are an integral part of that outcome so we pick up on uh quality consistency uh scalability as the key business drivers uh flexibility um openness um has your system been integrated into third-party solutions or do you run big change as a standalone job management job scheduling solution or is it embedded within your overall business systems so i think the journey we went through initially was to implement job watch as a standalone solution okay. we'd previously been running with a finance package that we had adapted to also include this manual this manual process and then this PDA based system that we had kind of as an interim. So we started by implementing big change and we went through a phased rollout. So we worked with 
couple of probably about 10% of our engineers to help set up and embed that solution. And we looked really for those early adopters in the business mm -hmm. to see who could then help us take it back in and roll it out into the business at full scale. So one, as once our engineers were all on board and we were up and running, we've then integrated big change back into a new finance package that we have, which is a separate cloud-based solution. So we use all of the APIs that are in place and these web hooks to draw information out around jobs, engineer time, materials, out of job watch and back into the finance package. Peter, you've set the scene. Uh, I mean, there are a thousand and one issues that you as a water company and a services company are dealing with. You've articulated that extremely clearly. So the question is, how are you managing to cope with this uptick in activity? What technical solutions have you adopted uh, to ensure that you can succeed in what is, after all, a very, very difficult area in terms of lack of staff and enhanced customer requirement? So I think centrally to all of that, big change sits behind what we've been looking to do with our business to date. So I mentioned to you before, it's replaced some legacy systems that took excessive amounts of time to run updates to and were really limited in terms of their scalability. We feel that big change is that scalable solution that we've been looking for. Since we've implemented it as a initially a standalone solution, we've carried out a number of integrations with other systems that we have in the business. So we operate currently with a Microsoft finance package and we use the APIs and the webhooks to pull real-time information from Big Change into this Microsoft package to run all the financial information behind the system. That was the first integration activity that we undertook. Since then, there's been a number of other really exciting developments I think, that we've made with the system. One of those includes around how we manage stock. Now, we know in our industry that understanding our stock profile at a vehicle level is central to delivering one of the key KPIs, which is a first visit fix. So our industry targets first fixed rates around plumbing and heating activity. We know that if you get the job right first time, right engineer, right part, it's that golden ticket moment for the customer. So what we really look to do is to firstly understand our van stock profiles and parts usage. So we work with Wolsey, who are one of the uh, market leading parts providers in the UK. And we had been running manual spreadsheets with Woolsey to look at what our van stock profile looked like, what our parts list looked like, and which parts were frequently being ordered that didn't feature on van stock. So we were then able to manually adjust what stock was held at a van level. One of the features that we've recently picked up in Big Change is around stock and inventory management and actually what we've recently done is each of our vehicles is detailed in big change and we have a complete van stock profile for that vehicle so if you're a heating engineer and i'm a plumber we'll carry different parts my van will reflect my stock yours will reflect yours and that allows us to see real time parts availability at that vehicle so an engineer will have a part on their van that they use on a job and we use Big Change to take that part off their van stock and allocate it to the job. And we use Big Change to carry through the pricing information. So we know in our back office how much the parts have cost on that job. Again, for the way that our business operates and the clients that we serve, understanding our cost per job is critical. So we've then used the APIs in Big Change and integrated with Woolsey's back-end stock management system. So when that engineer takes a part off their van and allocates it to a job, through these APIs, which I don't understand, but I've got, thankfully enough, some people around me that do, we use those APIs to place an order into Woolsey's back-end stock system. So the engineer no longer has to go onto Woolsey's website, carry through a part number, search through Woolsey's stock system, we can automate all of that. So the engineer, when they're in the home, can actually engage with the customer. Now, it's not about a time-saving exercise. It's about allowing an engineer to engage with the customer when they're in the home. That's what we want as a business. 
So this API will place the order into Woolsey's stock management system. And then the system will understand against each engineer what their nearest home-based branch is. And it, the API will then come back into Big Change and automatically allocate a job into an engineer's diary for two or three days' time for that engineer to go to that nominated branch and pick up that part as well as any others that they order in that interim period. So it allows us to understand stock movements, allows us to profile the van correctly to make sure that we can optimize for first fix. It allows engineers time in the home to engage. It carries through an automation process. So we know that information, there's no inaccuracies that you could get through manual entry. And it allows us to establish a set of controls and processes around when engineers go into a branch to pick up their parts. And once they're there, they use the big change device to scan the parts and it automatically puts it back into their van stock and adjust those numbers. So in real time, we can see who's carrying what stock, how much is it costing us, what's the value that we hold in the vans. And it's a re we're really proud of that innovative approach that we've taken because we know, you know, we, if we want to free up engineers time in the home, we've got to look at a business as what can we do to make an engineer's life easier? You know, and a challenge for an engineer should be understanding what they've got to do whilst they're in the home. How do you fix the issue that you're faced with? How do you take the customer with you and communicate clearly and be consistent and build that trust? So that's been a real key one. There's then others like that that are still in development. Just, just, uh, just stop that for a second. What you said is a complete um, change in everyone's view of field service, where we're just grateful if the chap turned up on the right day. Yeah. And that was good enough, wasn't it? Now you're saying the chap or the lady turns up with the right tools and the right equipment. Automatically, your, your vehicle has been, re or his or her vehicle has been restocked automatically by linking big change into Woolsey. Um, ultimately, the job's done as successfully, and I guess an invoice gets raised through dynamics via big change. And on top of that, the engineer is now able to have a sort of meaningful discussion with the end user or the client or the consumer about the whys and wherefores of um, or what the issue really was. So here's a question for you, is that given we spent the first 10 minutes explaining the issues in the environment, and the dramas and problems. You've now got a, an individual in a client's home. Are they spending time talking about net zero and all the things that SES could be doing in the future for them? Is there an element of uh, education involved in your, your engineer's visits? I think that's really the next piece for us, John, is how do we now utilize that time to drive mm -hmm. those types of conversations? Mm -hmm. I think how I've always tried to treat our businesses. I don't want our, my engineers just to go into home and try and sell the customer something for the mm. sake of trying to sell them. That's not, that. that's not the yeah. nature that we, how we try to operate. What, what I want to look to try and do is how do we build initially that trust with the customer? So like you've said, people want speed of response. They want somebody in the home. Once they're there, they want them to get it right. They want them to communicate with them and build that that trust and how do you if you instill that confidence you can then support customers and their buying behaviors i mean equally what we've seen is customer behavior changed in our sector over the years so it's in, interesting now that when a customer wants an engineer or wants a boiler replacement they go online and within three or four clicks of a button they can find a boiler that's going to go on their wall they can book a job they can have a contract to turn up in two or three days, it's a really simplified buying process. And that's what people expect now, you know, this whole world of Uber and, and a light, people expect that type of experience. And I think that's going to have to change as well. So you're using a portal for your customers yeah. to actually talk directly to you, no need to go through help, automated help desks and um, mm. press button one for this and button two for that. They can actually order online and book a slot Definitely. So I think customers want to engage in different ways. And I think you have to try and work with each of those situations to make sure that you're consistent with the service. So when we speak around buying behaviors and customers booking online, one of the other integrations that we've carried out is we've been developing our own front end customer booking portal. So a customer within our defined postcode territory can go into a portal 
and look for one of our engineers to carry out a job. And the system again uses these APIs and these hooks to look for real time availability within our engineers' diaries. And that, right. that I think will allow us in future to look at different types of propositions to support customers. So potentially uh, variable pricing mechanisms that we can introduce to say to a customer. Well, according to the time of day, you mean? According to the time of day that you want an engineer, the price might vary. You know, as, as a business, we're faced with increasing costs. Mm -hmm. And we have like to like an Uber model, maybe. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those flexible, flexible pricing models that I think actually can have a space in the market. And then that buying behavior we know exists because we can see that through the aggregator space already for boiler installations. Customers used to buy in a boiler online. Gotcha. Customers can order I, a taxi. I got a, I got a, sorry to interrupt you. I got a question then. So um, this is hypothetical, but is it real? So engineer is driving down through Isha, um, a lady, Somewhere in Isha has got an issue with uh, whatever it might be. She goes onto your portal and she puts an order in. Would that go straight to the engineer or would that go through a filtering system? In other words, would the engineer be like an Uber, able to be directed immediately to that person's property? Uh, not currently, no. But through the functionality that exists in Big Change, I think that's all achievable already, to be honest. Right. How our system works is that the customer would be presented with the available slots in that engineer's diary and the job would then, if the customer agrees, that customer's site and the job would automatically be created in big change and the job would be allocated to an engineer's diary. So yes, in concept, if there was an engineer down the end of the road that was available, that job could be booked in, go straight to the engineer and the engineer turns up. It's, it, I think it's a really versatile part of the system that was looking to understand and exploit more of, particularly then around data and using the data that can come back out of big change and how we can use that to drive more efficiencies into our business and understand how so we're how serving to, our customers. Okay, you mentioned data. Um, we're a data company because we have data on what 80,000 users get up to on a daily basis as they get tracked across the UK and abroad. So we have a massive amount of data. But from your point of view, what do you use the data that you got through your system for? What are the, what are the key sort of high level management metrics that you are constantly re looking at as the MD? So I think we're starting to understand now more than ever the importance of that data. Our okay. business model shifted probably around two years ago, and we started serving a different client base through a different mechanism. So we really need to understand our costs at a more granular level for the types of contracts that we have in place, the nature of work. So we're now you explore, exporting through the blueprints functionality, lots of data around jobs, engineer utilization, Where's the time going every day? How, much, how many miles has it taken us to get to a job? How much are we spending on parts on an average job? So we've had to go through a step change really. And I think we're much better placed now as a business to start utilizing that data more broadly, particularly through the API functionality. So we're looking at how do we have a data warehouse solution that can pull data in real time out of big change. Okay. To then present that in a visual format for our area managers and supervisors to see and feel and understand what's going on on a daily basis. We're definitely not there yet. We've got some way to go on that journey, but that's a one of that's a critical path item for our business. Okay, so you're a data company and you're beginning to look at your data. Um, you could have just in time delivery of fixing that leak down the road. So you are changing and using today's technology, location-based tracking and all that clever stuff. And indeed, big change, job management software. Um, are there any other applications that you, before we close, because I think we've had a lot of your time and thank you for that. Um, are there any other apps or applications, I should say, that you've had integrated into your big change job scheduling system? I think we've got other development opportunities on the roadmap so we're looking at video call functionality and how we can help customers through a soft serve a self-service type mechanism right. so i think in terms of integrations 
we're, we're most of the way there currently. I think the data piece is the next big one for us really to try and land. As a business, we use other third-party systems. You know, we work for a number of different clients that have other field service solutions behind them. Mm -hmm. And we're not, I don't believe that there's an integration opportunity there. But I think what is interesting is seeing how some of these other solutions are set up. And actually it's helped us realize the opportunities that exist with big change as a solution and the role that it can play in our business and how it can support scaling quickly. You know, what we've been able to achieve is Previously, our business was more reliant upon contractors. So we used to use the collaboration functionality within Big Change, and we worked with other Big Change clients to share jobs, pass them work out, and it allowed us still to maintain full visibility and control. I think there's definitely, that's a part of the system that we can do more with longer term. And I think I'm really interested to see how Big Change can take forward the concepts around more like bundled services, propositions, and supporting with procurement for vehicles and for fleet, uh, for fuel pricing. There's a, a lot of developments there on the big change roadmap that actually play really nicely into all of these challenges that we've spoke about. And it's exciting times within the industry, you know, seeing all of this activity that needs to be delivered and how we've got to take the industry, the sector, engineering teams and customers on that journey there's some really exciting times ahead of us i mean i'm excited to play a part in that and i really think there's a real real opportunity to drive to drive change for people and actually hit some of these targets and reduce our carbon footprint you know that's things that actually to me really really matter and i want to try and see how our business can play into that and i think there's a, some really good times ahead so I, I think that's an amazing summary, uh, absolutely key summary, and the, the, the two or three absolutely vital points which have come out of that debate from what you've been saying. Um, integration is king. Uh, no man is an island. Um, data lakes, whatever you want to call it, data warehousing gives you that high-level visibility. Um, customer, sat customer satisfaction, obviously you do your customer sat surveys. I know you get very high markings on that. Uh, Real-time performance, that came out loud and clear there. You mentioned Woolsey and the integration through big change into their stock management system, the fact that you, you got real-time job management, and you mentioned obviously integration into the, um, Microsoft Dynamics, which gives us the, uh, the benefit of real-time finance and accounting and able to get bills out on time. Um, so it, it sounds like big change has grown from being a standalone solution into a completely integrated partner, part of your overall business wrap. That's what I'm hearing here. And... Um, We'd like to thank you uh, very much for, if you feel like, opening the covers of SES Home Services for us all to look in and understand, A, the drivers, which we had up on the, on the, on the chart, and B, how technically uh, you have organized yourself. Also, of course, how you've managed yourself, all done by yourself as the managing director. Thank you, John. So, Peter, thank you very much indeed, and no. thanks for your time this afternoon. Thank you for yours, and um, we're excited to see how big change can continue to feature as part of that the digital landscape that we're operating in and how as a business we can play our role in supporting our customers through this transition that lays ahead. So thanks for your time and discussing that, John. Our pleasure. Thanks, Peter. Mm -hmm.